So I am super excited to welcome to Money Talks uh, one of the newest members of the ABRA team, uh, Marissa Kim. Marissa is a general partner in ABRA Capital Management, which is the institutional asset management arm of ABRA now. So uh, welcome, Marissa, to Money Talks. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you. So um, let's get into it. So first of all, tell us about how you got into crypto and yeah. and and you know why why you know why now why is crypto so exciting to you personally? Yeah, I mean, I got into crypto about um, around 2016, which is pretty early um, given how new the industry is. And I had some friends that were kind of early builders in the space. So they kind of initially started talking to me about what they were doing. One was um, a friend that was actually trading Bitcoin and like building some early algorithms to trade Bitcoin, um, which was not a very big or liquid market at that point. Um, but I was just really curious about it. And I just started kind of doing my own research and reading a little bit about it. And it just seemed, um, you know, the thing that really got me excited about it was the community of people that I met. So I think, you know, around that time, it was like, Two or 300 people worldwide that worked in crypto, you know, full time. So it was a very, very small industry, but it was a really interesting and unique group of um, individuals. And a lot of those people are still in the industry and the industry is much bigger now. But it was really the community of people that, that got me in. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And and so obviously uh, in, in, you know, running Abra's asset management uh, division you're, or, or as a GP there, you're obviously very bullish on you know crypto for institutions yeah. and so what's your take on where we are with overall institutional interest how do you first of all how do you define institutions so so that we're, we're all kind of talking about the same thing and then what's your take on where we are in terms of those institutions being interested in crypto and why yeah, I mean, I think the term institutions generally refers to endowments, pension funds, um, big banks like J.P. Morgan, you know, Goldman Sachs. Sometimes they include, you know, big, big family offices that are run, you know, that are in the hundreds of millions in AUM and are, have a team of um, investors, you know, professional investors that invest their capital. So I think it's probably when we say institutional investors, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. And, and, and what is their interest today? Has first of all, has it changed over the last 12, 18, 24 months? And 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 what is it today? Yeah, I mean, I think what you saw in 2017, which was kind of the um, you know, the first kind of bubble where I think the the hype around the industry got a little bit ahead of kind of the actual foundations of what was being built. And I think, you know, that's when institutions started kind of chiming in first. You heard, you know, people kind of um, very skeptical about where the industry was going and whether it's real. And then I think in around 2019, you started um, and leading into 2020, you started to see the institutions really try to start to take this industry seriously. And you saw that in a lot of their, you know, the research they were putting out, some of the um, people that were bold enough to kind of take a stand on CNBC and some of the big fund managers and, you know, really well-respected investors that started getting excited about what Bitcoin was, you know, what's being built in Web3. Yep. And I think that we've started to actually hit the point where there's starting to be some career risk around not having exposure. Right. Right. And the initial exposure was really a very small, you know, token under, you know, 1% of your assets. People were buying Bitcoin. A lot of them were through kind of um, passive, you know, vehicles like the Grayscale Trust. And I think what we're going to see next is really kind of more bespoke and interesting products yep. um, and funds like ours. So, so let's let's break it down a little bit. I, I'm hearing more and more that some institutions prefer to actually talk about Ethereum versus Bitcoin. Yeah. So let's start with that, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the nuances of Web three itself, but. It, are you seeing the same thing yes. or, okay. And, and why do you think that is? Why is, do you think that there's a, that the interest in Ethereum at the institutional level is probably growing faster than, than Bitcoin right now? I think it's because the, the value prop for Ethereum is a little bit easier for them to understand because the, the monetary policy that they've kind of grown up in and like are kind of invested in as the, you know, the institutional, um, the institutions that are in the space, you know, that's that's really their the the policies that they've grown up under. So I think Ethereum and um, kind of other Web three protocols are a little bit easier to understand kind of the value prop, and it's non threatening to them. 
um, yep. in some ways. So when you say value prop, it would be things like how stable coins work via smart contracts, yeah. how NFTs work via smart contracts, how DeFi works and why that's making Ethereum like the world's computer, as we've been saying on, on yeah. Money Talks, for example. That's okay. Right. And and all right. So, so let's build on that for a second. Let's talk about Web3 itself. So how do you think about Web3? How, how do you explain the Web3 opportunities to institutions that are excited about this space potentially and are just learning. Uh, but how do you explain Web3 to them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really this kind of shift to, um, you know, an internet that is owned kind of by the creators and the and the users and versus the kind of centralized internet, which is really, you know, users kind of being exploited for their um, data and their information. And um, it's, you know, hopefully a more equitable, equitable um, internet. And, you know, we'll see if that's actually the case. But I think it is kind of, you know, the, the next iteration of the, of the web. So I think just having some exposure to that is really exciting. And, and do you find skepticism around that idea so far? I mean, I know it's early, but or, or do you find that, that it's intuitively obvious and people are embracing it? Where, where do the institutions come out in terms of that thesis for, for Web3 today? Yeah, I think it's a little like, you know, the concept of decentralization is a little is a paradigm shift for everybody. So um, you have these kind of gatekeepers that are very comfortable with the way it is now. And I think some of the skepticism is really around um, being very comfortable being, you know, the, the ones that have the power and are kind of exploiting users. Yeah. So I think there is some skepticism as to why decentralization matters. But I think a few things have like you know, things like Twitter and, you know, everything that we're seeing um, where people are getting deplatformed, that type of um, scenario yeah. is actually really pushing, like adding fuel to the whole idea of decentralization. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I think that the more I see, and, and we, we show these charts all the time, uh, the more I see these kind of network effect diagrams out there, the Twitterverse and, and crypto Twitter, you know, Kathy Woods publishes the research for free, Rob Paul publishes a significant portion of Real Vision's research for free. Uh, Peter Diamandis and, and Tony Robbins have been talking about this kind of, you know, movement, uh, the singularity movement of exponential tech. It seems like there's a growing acceptance that you can be very early in the cycles for these exponentially growing technologies to reap the biggest benefits. And institutions are now saying, hey, you know, it's volatile, but if we want to generate returns, we've got to be early in, in some of these new technologies earlier than we might have been before, where it was mostly venture capital that was funding these new technologies. Is that, I don't know, I, I, do you have those kind of conversations with institutions now? Yeah, I and mean, I think some institutions really view it as, um, you know, a financial asset that can be traded just like any other commodity or any other um, you know, financial asset. And then there's those that are more interested in the tech and treat mm -hmm. it more like right. a venture capital. They're more interested in the fundamentals and they're comfortable with the volatility. Um, but there's definitely yep. a lot kind of saying, do you have any products that are, you know, market neutral? And, you know, they were, were really afraid of the volatility, which is kind of the part that we think is really exciting. So yep. there's both camps. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk for a few minutes about, um, about ACM, Abra Capital Management. So so Abra Capital Management has already several funds up and running. So why don't you fill us in on what those are? And, and I'll try to, to bring up some notes on the screen here while you're talking and uh, let Mr. Wizard know when, when to turn it on. But um, so give us an overview of, of what's happening inside of Abra Capital Management today. Yep. So we've launched two venture funds. Um, one is actually investing in tokens and one is investing in, in equity and tokens, but really the same kind of thesis around where we think Web3 is going. And the, the difference between the two funds is really the liquidity. So the venture fund that's invested in equity is obviously a traditional 10-year fund. Um, and the, the token fund is has a three-year lockup. So, but very similar in terms of our, our approach and kind of looking for asymmetric opportunities within the Web3 space and kind of leveraging our domain um, knowledge on this space that we've kind of built up over the years of operating and building Abra and yep. just our own investing, yep. kind of offering that to our clients. Yeah, so uh, we'll show here some of yep. the, uh, the, on the screen, uh, our viewers will be able to see an overview of some of the institutional uh, services and products uh, in terms of both services and funds, uh, everything ranging from earning interest, trading, institutional borrowing, 
Let's dig in on the funds themselves. Mm-hmm. So, so talk about AAO, uh, Venture Fund One, high yield funds, how they yeah. work, what they do, uh, and, and, and tell us what's up. Yeah, so Alternative Assets Opportunity Fund is really our flagship fund, and that um, it's kind of a hybrid vehicle where we, we try to invest um, you know, pre-launch in tokens and these projects that are kind of at a seed stage, and they may be in, in development, but they really haven't launched yet. So we see yep. these, these um, deals very, very early and vet these, you know, vet these protocols and have our tech team kind of t- dig into the code. Um, and, you know, we also invest in liquid opportunities as well, because a lot of the liquid tokens are projects that are very, very early. Some of them I would also call seed stage mm. in terms of their adoption. So they're, they're listed on an exchange, but there's still a lot of upside. So, and actually right now there's a lot of good opportunities to buy in the, in the liquid token markets, as well as the, you know, pre-launch markets, which are pretty overcrowded with capital right now. And we're seeing that in the valuations being very, very high. Yep. Um, and then the equity funds, um, Abra Venture Fund One, kind of investing in the same types of companies and protocols, um, but it's really just whether the company is raising equity, and usually they're raising a combination of equity and tokens. So they'll raise a seed round of equity, but then you'll get the token when, once it launches. Yep. Um, and then yep. the yield funds are really the Abra Earn product. Um, so they're in, in the structure of a fund, and that's you know, preferable to a lot of institutional investors, they would rather invest through a fund versus obviously not through an app, um, but even just through a platform, it's really not the form factor that they're used to. Mm-hmm. And there's also some tax benefits, at least for U.S. investors. So the interest income that you're earning, it's, you know, deferrable and you get long-term capital gains versus having to pay, um, you know, um, so it's it's definitely advantageous. Sure. It's just an alternative. Sounds great. And so, so what are some of the, just kind of scrolling backwards here to show folks some of the, the core investment opportunities, what, do you, what are you excited about? So when you think about, let's focus on tokens for a minute, we'll yeah. come back to, uh, to equity. When you think about kind of the, 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 the current token economy, what are you excited about and why? Yeah, and I think a lot of our early investments have been in kind of these layer one, layer two, kind of web three stacks. So it's Really, there's still a lot of opportunities um, for the infrastructure that's going to power a lot of these consumer applications. And so layer one blockchains, um, you know, scaling solutions, um, interoperability, because you have all these different blockchains and they have siloed developers and liquidity. And that's really not, you know, you're not going to have Internet scale applications with that. So I think there's a lot of problems to really be solved in that um, kind of layer one, layer two. Yeah. Um, and then also DeFi is obviously a space that, you know, we we deploy assets into DeFi. So we're, we're um, pretty focused on this space and we kind of have a really good understanding as a user of what the problems are in that space. And I think there will be kind of the institutionalization of DeFi in the next couple of years where you're going to see identity projects, insurance, um, and just things that institutions will need in order to start deploying assets into DeFi. But what I think what's really exciting is that in the next couple of years, hopefully we'll see kind of the user experience um, improve because, you know, if any of you tried to buy NFTs or use DeFi, it's really, really um, difficult. There's usually, you know, 15 to 20 steps um, in order to even access the the, um, protocol or application. So I'm really excited about kind of the next version of of NFTs, um, you know, having more utility and then just some more user-friendly kind of metaverse and GameFi experiences. Yeah. So, um, yeah, fantastic. And and so let's let's uh, let me turn this off here so we can uh, move on to the next topic. Sorry, and sorry, my Zoom skills are mediocre. Um, let, let's talk about the venture side now. So so we have the token economy, right? Which is early stage, some cases illiquid tokens, where you know large accredited investors, institutions want to get early access. And we are talking about accredited investors here, right? So for some of you who kind of more retail. Uh, I don't agree with the rules, but those are the rules in the U.S., right? So we have to uh, deal with the credit investors for these funds. I think it's ridiculous, but like I said, we follow the rules. And now we have this idea of of traditional equity, which we've never done at, at Abra before. But uh, personally, we've had a lot of experience with this, right? We, we you and I have made uh, investments in in many companies in the space. I've invested in several. Uh, venture funds, uh, particularly early stage. I'm an advisor to several venture funds. This is really exciting for me. So, you know, we have all these companies that are coming to Abra constantly for help. Uh, you know, I want Abra to use our product in the crypto space. I want Abra to list our, our token when our company launches. And how do you feel about why 
Abra is, or can you explain why Abra is uniquely positioned mm -hmm. to generate uh, meaningful returns and be a strong player in, in kind of the early stage equity part of the crypto space? Yeah, I think there's two reasons. And one is really because um, we are using a lot of these protocols and companies um, for Abra for you know a variety of reasons. Some in DeFi, some, you know, we're looking at DAO launch pads, we're looking at some NFT stuff and yep. some things we haven't even announced. Um, but I think when you look through the lens of being a user, it's a very different um, experience than just, you know, a traditional investor if you're just reading a white paper and kind of looking at it. Um, from more of a passive viewpoint, it's a really different um, kind of investment thesis that you have because, you know, I always tell people if you want to understand crypto, you have to use it. So I think that's the best way to understand any product and understand like the holes in the ecosystem. So I think as an operator, we have a real advantage. And then two, I think the other thing that you alluded to is that, um, you know, the, first of all, there's these, there's tons of, there's too much money in the space, all chasing after the same private deals. There's several hundred million plus seed stage venture funds that are investing in crypto, which, you know, seed stage funds usually are not that large. And, right. um, you know, there's too much capital and that makes the deals very, very competitive to get into, but we can actually offer these companies and protocols, you know, super valuable, either like being an early pilot customer mm -hmm. of theirs, which is, you know, yep. helps them get feedback and helps them grow. Totally. Um, you know, we can also, we have distribution, we have, you know, a wide audience of crypto investors, both retail and, and institutional. We have content, we have shows like this that we can bring them on. So we have a lot of things that we can offer yep. um, our investments. Yeah. I mean, it's really fun because there's so much developer, um, you know, activity going on in the space you know uh i'm kind of the, the boomer of the crypto space now and to see all these kids coming in and and just creating these these crazy new projects that you know even i hadn't thought would be possible 12 years ago when i first got into bitcoin and and it's just really exciting and it's really fun to, to be a part of it and you know other folks in abra you know are, are able to provide due diligence because they're going really deep on the tech already inside of Abra for our own needs, right? Whether it's our product team or our engineering team or even our marketing team for that matter. Um, so I, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. And so we've also, uh, you know, without giving too much away now, we'll probably get into it in the future, but we've also brought on some really great advisors who have a lot of experience in, in consumer venture, uh, but don't have as much experience in, uh, in crypto. And that's great because we can kind of complement each other uh, in terms of how to add value and how to measure the the potential for um, these, you know, basically kids who are trying to start really cool companies mm -hmm. and what it's going to take to to be successful. Because the reality is most startups don't make it, and um, that makes it very hard to pick uh, to pick winners and losers. And and it doesn't really, I don't really want it to be our job to say, you know, here's this this person is going to be the winner and this person is going to be the loser. I think. I'm actually even more excited about the potential of, okay, we need this at Abra. Our customers need this. Can we help bring this along, whether it's just financially, which is probably the least interesting part of it, but in terms of awareness, in terms of product integration, in terms of marketing, and you know, in terms of user feedback, in terms of distribution, et cetera, et cetera. That's really interesting to me. Um, I mean, I don't know, how, 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 do you, how do you look at all this? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think, um, you know, there's, there aren't too many because we're super, super early. There aren't too many people who have made the transition from building a great company in crypto to becoming an investor. So I think we just have a little bit of an advantage yeah. um, on that front and I'm yeah. super excited to see how it evolves. So. Yep. Yeah. And I think it's, there's also going to be a huge amount of kind of startup consolidation mm -hmm. in the crypto world that hasn't even started yet because partially because the valuations have been too high. Um, and that's going to change, uh, you know, that's one thing we haven't really talked about. I mean, in the kind of, let's call it the non-crypto venture world, whether it's early stage or private equity valuations have plummeted, right? We haven't totally seen that yet in crypto, right? I mean, for early stage private equity, uh, the valuations have come down, but not to the extent that they have in other markets. Is that fair? Yes, the, the crypto valuations, especially for the protocol companies, are very, very high. You know, you'll see seed stage companies raising it at 50 million to anywhere from 50 million to a couple hundred million valuation pre-product. You know, to uh, we've actually seen a lot of either college dropouts or people who are kind of taking a semester off and building 
and launching a product, you know, at a hackathon, and then they go and raise, you know, twenty million dollars on a seed stage product at a crazy valuation. So that does give us a little bit of pause, um, and we're very careful about how we think about investing and participating in those deals. Um, but it's it is what it is. There's a lot of money that's very excited to invest in the space. Yeah, I so agree. I agree. Well, we would love to have you on regularly. Give us an update on what's happening in the markets. Because I think venture early stage token deals really give us a good indicator of what's going to come, and so mm-hmm. so we'll we'll look to you, Marissa, as kind of a uh, an early indicator of where all of this is going, and we'd love to hear hear your insights on on a regular basis, and maybe you want to bring a couple of the CEOs along with you uh, from some of these projects to give us to give us an update on you know everybody's asking me what's the next Solana? I miss Solana, so mm-hmm. so you can give us some insights with some of these awesome CEOs that. Uh, that we're working with now. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, I think I'm going to be at MIT in a few weeks and maybe we'll even do a show from there. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, thank you so much for joining us. We're thrilled to have you at Abra. I know we've been working together for, for a couple of years on this and uh, I'm really excited about uh, the potential here. So thanks for joining us on Money Talks. Thank you.